Anyone who knew Richard well uh, knew that when he was the most pleased, he would always turn to a wisecracker of some sort. Uh, if he were here this morning and saw the assembled clergy, uh, he'd be pleased as punch, I'll guarantee you. But he'd probably say, what, nothing on TV today? <laughs> <laughs> His good friend, Dr. Musty, is sitting over behind me, who took care of Richard and put up with him for the last 25 years. And he'd probably look at him, he'd be very pleased. But it would be a little late, aren't we? <laughs> so when Richard found a line, <clears throat> a phrase, a song, a movie, whatever it is that pleased him, he clung to that like it was a life raft in a heavy sea. Uh, so stick with me on this and see if you remember this. And so said the preacher, now we come to the time to remember good things about the deceased. And who will start? And of course, there was nothing but silence. Well, twice more the request was met with silence. <clears throat> come now, said the preacher. There must be some good qualities we can remember. And with that, a man stood up in the back row and said, well, his brother was worse. <laughs> so, Father Richard's favorite joke, and I'm going to retire that tonight, and it'll never be heard again. <laughs> For over 30 years, Richard was the genes of my uh, friend, one of the best. The persona he liked to display often seemed irascible, uh, frustrating, cleverly rude, bordering on insulting, and yet there was no one you would rather have with you when you were hurting. When our daughter Maureen died, and later our son Kevin, Richard was a rock and endeared himself to our entire family forever after. Traveling with Richard was a little like getting caught in a time warp. <clears throat> he knew more about the movie industry than anyone I'd ever met, but his taste in movies themselves was arrested with Casablanca from which he could quote just about every line verbatim. Any attempt I made to get him to expand and appreciate later movies was to him just a prime example of my bad taste. <laughs> and the same with music, which with the exception of Broadway musicals, as far as Richard was concerned, it died with the death of Harry James, Tex Beneke, Glenn Miller, and so forth. But long rides were long rides with Richard the day that he discovered serious radio in my car. <laughs> it meant finding a big, doc, big band station, and there were four of them, and getting a running commentary on who was playing what instrument, the year it was first performed, and details that I'd defy anybody Richard to do. Now, for a number of years, Gene and I invited Richard to join us for vacations in Palm Springs. And it was a place that he loved right up until March 18th, 2013. His love for older forms of entertainment made him a natural for the fabulous Palm Spring Follies. It's a musical revival of Zigfield Follies featuring retired Vegas showgirls and guys. And it attracted the oldest audience west of Branson, Missouri. <laughs> now, one night there was a time, the first time I ever saw Richard stop dead in his tracks. And that's a true story. The MC had asked, are there any Canadians in the audience? And Richard was leaped to his feet. And the spotlight went on him, and the MC said, where are you from? And after a long pause, Richard turned to me and said, where am I from? <laughs> and the audience was rolling in the aisles. And another night that we were there, he was always doing something that would embarrass me. Another night we were there, they announced that Betty Hutton, the old film actress, was in the audience. And as we were leaving, Richard spotted her, and he suddenly darted off to pay his respects, as he put it. I could see security converging on him. <laughs> and I thought, oh, here we go, only to see Betty Hutton turn around, say, Richard, and give him a big hug. So, he loved a talented musician. And the piano player at Mario's was one of the best. Mario's was a place with singing waiters and waitresses, Richard's favorite place to eat. And by the way, eating out with Richard was often an adventure because Richard would always start conversations with the people at the surrounding tables. 
And at Mario's, you'd think he was the host. Uh, one night he got up to go to the restroom. It took a while for him to come back. I went to look for him. Coming back, I found him. He was sitting on the piano bench with the piano player, the spotlight on the two of them, turning pages and chatting away to his heart's content. <laughs> and the year that Mario's closed, Richard considered it at least a local disaster. For 30 years, we cooked for him. Oh, we prayed him through a series of heart procedures, during which time I accompanied him on a morphine trip one night that Dr. Tim O'Leary would have just loved. Uh, that's a story that Brian won't let me take the time to tell you about, but it's a good one. <laughs> we argued, we counseled, we laughed, we indulged in an occasional martini or two until he quit them 10 years ago. And Bob Lyons is fond of saying that was when the fun Richard stopped. But not really true. But we watched him over the last few years slowly go away. And despite it all, he never lost his persona. And the day that we said goodbye, I asked him what he was looking forward to most in heaven, which was a subject we used to debate quite a bit. And his answer was, well, the food's got to be better than it is in this place. <laughs> And there was a debate at the end about his last move from Pleasanton to Los Gatos. And I finally asked Richard one afternoon, I said, Richard, what do you want? Because everybody wanted something for Richard. And his response was one word, it was freedom. He hated the indignities and the infirmities of advanced years. He never liked to call it old. At my daughter Maureen's funeral, Richard concluded his homily, saying, Maureen is well again. Well, today, Richard has his freedom. Richard is well again, and rightly so. So God bless you, Grace. <laughs>